Go ahead, Dipti. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the inaugural session of a new speaker series called India's Story. I'm Dipti Desai, and I head the West Coast Division for US-India Strategic Partnership Forum, or USISPF. USISPF is committed to creating the most powerful strategic partnership between the US and India. Our mission is to bring business leaders and government together to drive economic growth, foster entrepreneurship, and create meaningful impact. With offices in DC, New Delhi, New York, Mumbai, and San Francisco, USISPF boasts a board of directors of CEOs from Fortune 50 companies across the US and India. We are excited to collaborate on the speaker series with the Consulate General of India in San Francisco and with DEAR TV. DEAR TV is America's largest Indian American broadcast TV network, reaching over 50 million viewers nationwide in major markets, including New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, San Francisco, and beyond. DEAR TV provides a flavor of home for Indians in America and a window into the Indian thought and culture to the mainstream American viewer. Representing the Consulate General of India in San Francisco is Ambassador Dr. TV Nagendra Prasad, who joined this post mid-COVID and has hit the ground running. Ambassador Prasad joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1993 and has since served in various capacities for the Indian government. His career has taken him from Tehran, London, the Gulf, Turkmenistan to San Francisco. It's been a pleasure to work with him and his team. We at USISPF have been grateful to have the support of the consulate in aiding startups and enterprises in the Western Pacific region. And we are honored to have Ambassador Prasad give the opening remarks today. Ambassador Prasad. Thank you, Ed Deepti, for the generous introduction. And thank you to USISPF and DRTV for joining hands with the consulate to celebrate India and the success stories of Indians in the Bay Area. I'm very honored uh, to serve uh, in San Francisco as it carries a great legacy. Indian citizens uh, first started to migrate to the United States in the late 19th century when Punjab, uh, Punjabi and Sikh farmers came to the US. They worked in agricultural fields and built the railroads in 1970s came the wave of Indians seeking higher education and by mid 90s uh, we saw a steady flow of tech professionals and innovators making their way into the Silicon Valley and then beyond. Uh, we often forget uh, to pause and take stock of the incredible contributions uh, these uh, American Indians have, are making towards the fabric of American society economy and progress, and also strengthening of Indo-US relations. Uh, Indian Americans are now the largest Asian American community, one of the large in the US. Uh, they also happen to be the most affluent and most educated ethnic group uh, in the US. Uh, we are proud to see uh, Indian Americans making their mark, and this is precisely uh, we are glad uh, to partner with USISPF and DRTV to highlight the achievements of uh, Indian Americans and their unique India story uh, to, uh, to, to viewers via DRTV and USPF, USISPF. We are looking forward to hearing from you, Mr. Jyoti Bansal. Thank you very much for making uh, this happen. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Prasad. And now to begin our speaker series, we'd like to welcome Jyoti Bansa. Jyoti is well known to the Valley. An approachable and affable techno geek, Jyoti is a serial entrepreneur and a venture capitalist. 
Jyoti built his first startup, App Dynamics, which he sold at the cusp of going IPO to Cisco for $3.7 billion. After creating hundreds of jobs and a successful exit, Jyoti was ready for more. His current ventures include Big Labs, a startup studio where founders can come together to co-create companies, Harness, a DevOps company that became the industry's first continuous as a delivery as a service platform, and most recently, Jyoti co-founded Traceable, an AI startup that secures cloud native applications with distributed tracing. He's also a venture capitalist and co-founder of Unusual Ventures, a seed stage venture fund. His success is the result of his brilliance, hard work, and perseverance. And to help us bring his India story to life is our moderator, Kailesh Karwadra, Kailesh is an ENY veteran and is currently the managing partner of EY's West Region Growth Markets, where he leads and nurtures entrepreneurs. Kailesh. Thank you so much, Diti, for the warm introductions. Welcome, Jyoti. Uh, it is a privilege to be here in a conversation with you. I know the audience is eager to start hearing your journey and perspective. So let's jump right in. What I thought we would do is split up our conversation and the time we have into maybe five sections. Uh, first, maybe growing up in India, what life was like there. Then we'll go to your early start in the US and journey to Silicon Valley. We'll touch on your entrepreneurship success and what you're doing today. Maybe we'll then uh, complete with the general section on current affairs. What's going on in the world? Your views of what's around the corner, and then mm -hmm. lastly, we'll end with some Q&A. And so for our audience out there, uh, we invite you to send in your questions and I'll do my very best to filter through them and get them to Jyoti. So with that, Jyoti, talk to us about your early experiences growing up in Rajasthan and India. First of all, uh, I'm very excited to uh, join this inaugural session of the India Story and uh, great to be here. Uh, you know, my um, my background, I grew up in in, in a a mid-sized town in, in Rajasthan, a city called Ajmer. And it was it was a middle class, like a normal Indian middle class family. Uh, my dad had a small business, you know, what you would call a mom and pop shop in the US uh, and multiple small businesses. You know, it was uh, when I grew up, you know, I would look at like, you know, the kind of what we see in Indian middle class, like, you know, there is a lot of focus on education. You know, your parents want you to become engineers and doctors and, you know, go, go to, uh, you know, engineering schools or medical schools. So very similar kind of thing. You know, uh, I got into, uh, you know, my, my dad had a business for irrigation, like, you know, selling irrigation machinery to farmers. So farmers can do, uh, do their irrigation, right? So for me, like growing up, you know, you know, it was, uh, we were not like very uh, rich or affluent, uh, you know, but it was, it was a, you know, a lot of learnings you do. And for me, the biggest learning when I was growing, it was also helping my dad through, a, through his business. A lot of times people ask me like, you know, okay, how do you, where did you get your first business exposure? Did you do an MBA and went to business school? To me, like my MBA was when I was a kid, helping uh, sell irrigation machinery to farmers, uh, you know, and that's, that's a, that's a lot of business stuff you learn at that time. Like, you know, after, and normally like after school or weekends, you know, in the, you will go and help, you know, your dad on, on his shop. That's what, that's, that's why I, I grew up uh, doing that. Um, and you know, like, like a lot of kids in India, like, you know, you, uh, where you want to get, get into engineering schools, medical schools. I didn't really have any uh, exposure to, you know, computers until I actually, uh, almost when I got into college. Uh, but I started applying for to get into IIT, and you know I, uh, you know, went to IIT Delhi, and that was the, uh, that was kind of my transition out into engineering and technology. So. And, and Jyoti, in those early days before you went to uh, university, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Just who were your influences that influenced you to continue education? I read about your grandfather's library, mm -hmm. and and like you mentioned, there were no computers. So how did you actually get interested in? continuing to study? I think, um, you know, one great thing as we all know in the, you know, in the Indian middle class, there's a lot of focus on education, right? You know, we all want to compete and get, you know, the children to be educated. And my, my parents were like that as well. My grandfather was a metallurgist in, uh, you know, for the Indian railways uh, back in the days. So he, you know, there was like science and, uh, uh, tech and uh, you know those were kind of a little bit even if you're if you're in a small town was part of our family 
my dad was running this kind of a small business, but he was electrical engineer by training as well. Uh, so, you know, I, I really, um, uh, you know, in science, math, engineering, that was kind of interesting and exciting uh, to me. And it, it seemed uh, uh, like, you know, something that was a bit natural. So, uh, and then, so that was kind of my influence in my family. But when there was also the business side of influence, like in almost everyone, you know, I was in this kind of a very typical Marwadi family in Rajasthan where like almost every cousin, uncle, everyone had some kind of a small business. Like someone was selling clothes, someone was selling groceries, someone was selling something, but everyone had less sort of a business and some shop of some kind. So, you know, you get like a lot of you to see them, you see what succeeds, what fails, what doesn't. So that's become sort of your indirect influence as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Jyoti. And as I mentioned, Ajmer uh, is one of my most spiritual places in the world that I've visited many times. So great to know you're from there. Let's move on to higher education. Um, you mentioned you went to Delhi IIT, which is just fantastic. Share some learnings and influences from what that experience was like. And as you said, you got influenced into computers and technology there. <laughs> yes. Um, you know, I, I would say like, you know, I, I picked computer science and engineering, but that would be a lie. Yeah, normally, and when you go into IIT at that time, you know, like you're 17 years old, you don't even know what, what engineering you want to do. So you just go with like, what's the best, you know, is recommended, where would you get the most, uh, you know, uh, what's the most, uh, let's say has the most lucrative career. You don't really know like what you really are passionate about at that age, you know. So, uh, so I took computer science because I had like, I was in the top 100 in, uh, in, I, in the kind of the IIT exam, exam and, you know, most people would pick computer science first. Before that, I really didn't have much exposure to computer science and engineers. And now I'm like a computer geek and nerd and, <laughs> and a computer scientist of all kinds, right? Uh, you know, it's a, when you go from like a small town into, into just like a big city in Delhi, that was my first exposure there. And you were like 17 years old, first time out of your home. Uh, it's a, it's, there's a bit of cultural shock, which is not too different than the first time you move to the US. Like when you move from India to US, there's a bit of a culture shock that happens, but, you know, going from even from like, you know, from uh, where I grew up to Delhi and kind of study there. And that's, that it's itself. Initially you go through a cultural shock and you learn, learn a lot. Like you learn and you, 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 uh, you know, you get exposure to so many different things and so many people from so many uh, different parts of the country very, very quickly. So that that's also part of the learning. Like it's not just the learning on, you know, you know, when you when you go into a place like IIT or in, any engineering school like that, right? So you learn a lot from people around you, not just the academics. Right? Now, uh, without getting you into any trouble with your professors at school, I read somewhere um, that you skipped many classes because you like to self-learn. Um, were you a good student? <laughs> I wasn't. Uh, in IIT, I was not. You know, I don't like to say that because, you know, the, the, the folks at IIT, they don't want me to say that. But, uh, but it's, you know, I, I actually, I like to learn on, at my own pace. And I'm not, you know, um, uh, so I'm not, not, like everyone has a different way of learning, right? You know, I would go and read myself somewhere and learn much faster than uh, sitting through a, through a, you know, through a class. Uh, so I skipped majority of my classes, yes, and uh, um, I don't recommend other students to do that, but that's what I did. <laughs> that's a good message. Yeah, don't skip classes, everybody. Yes. But uh, Jyoti, just fast forwarding now, so you graduated, and now where did the motivation to come mm -hmm. to the U.S. Uh, come from? Sure. So this was uh, 1999 when I graduated from IIT. Uh, you know, my I was really thrilled about sort of the notion of startups, the startups and, you know, and it, it was still pretty early in India at that time. Like there was really no startup tech startup ecosystem at that time. Like now we have a very thriving tech startup ecosystem 20 years later, which is amazing, but not back then. And, you know, when you, and you would hear all these stories of Silicon Valley, like, you know, Silicon Valley where this kind of magic happens and, you know, company engineers, software engineers create exciting technologies and all, all this exciting new things that are coming out of there. So I was pretty fascinated about Silicon Valley, really. To me, it's like, you know, that's the, like, you know, if you have to be at the, the sort of the epicenter of software and technology in the world, you know, to me at that time, Silicon Valley was really the only option to, to be. So, you know, I, you know, a lot of students when they come out of IIT, like especially at back then at that time, uh, the, the most common thing for people was to do was to apply for higher education in the US for masters and PhDs and come, come over here uh, with that, right? Uh, I, I wasn't really interested in it to me it's like you know I've studied enough I need to go in the industry and do something so I I started just applying for 
for startups, uh, you know, for jobs in startups uh, directly from, you know, uh, after that, because I want, that's what I wanted to do. And my fascination with coming to the US and uh, Silicon Valley was also to do with, uh, uh, with the, just the startup ecosystem. And um, how did the actual journey to the US take place uh, financially, logistically? And, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, immigration and those things later, but just in terms mm -hmm. of, I read somewhere that you had $200 in your pocket. That's what you came to the US with. Uh, yeah, you know, I really didn't have like, you know, when you, when you, I was, I just really graduated from school and, you know, you didn't really have, you know, through, through IITs, I didn't, uh, you know, uh, you know, I paid through some of it, like some, uh, let's say, you know, extra expenses by, you know, uh, by being a part-time teacher for like, you know, other kids outside of IIT, et cetera. And I didn't really have that much of financial means uh, to come to the US, right? So I I, I applied, I, I was applying for jobs here pretty actively from, uh, you know, in jobs in the in the Silicon Valley area. And uh, once I got my job, I all I all I needed some money to, to take my flight here. And just to get get over here, like before, I will get my first paycheck. So yes, I had two hundred dollars that I uh, that I that I came in in, in uh, came here with, and, uh, and then I had to like you know wait until my first paycheck that I would get to get any any more money. Makes your journey even more impressive, Jyoti. Uh, thank you for sharing some of those personal things. Now I understand you started in New Jersey, right, on the East Coast before you came to Silicon Valley. Uh, just for a small period, you know, it's the, I started working for a startup back in, uh, you know, back in Delhi and for just for a few months, <clears throat> they had an office in New Jersey and I was there for a, for a, for a few months, not, you know, actually it even solidified my desire to come to Silicon Valley because I didn't really like New Jersey much. <laughs> I know there's a lot of exciting things there, but to me, it's like, you know, we, I, I got to move to where the, the, you know, to California and, 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 and the San Francisco area. The weather is much better here. So good choice. Um, in, in terms of uh, entrepreneurship, let me move on to that, um, Jyoti, because <clears throat> when I was reading up about your journey uh, while you were working, you always, it seemed, had the bug to have a startup. But because of challenges of visas and immigration mm -hmm. and status and things, it, it was very difficult. Maybe share with the audience a little bit about that piece of your, your journey. Sure. Um well, it, the unfortunate part, you know, and most, a lot of uh, us, who, uh, you know, Indians who come here on immigration visas, mostly we come on H-1B, right? Uh, or if you, even if you come on a student visa, then you go into an H-1B and then you get your first job, et cetera. Unfortunately, the immigration system here, it's, there is a, you know, if you're on H-1B, you're not allowed to quit your job and start a company or start a business, which to me is the most ridiculous thing you could, you could do as a, as, as a, if you just look at, you know, from a U.S. perspective, if you have some of the best engineers coming to the country here, and if they want to ever start a company and a business, why would you stop them? Like starting a business is the core of like, you know, what, are econ what drives economies forward. Like you have entrepreneurship, you have new job creation, you have new you know, new value creation happening. So slowing it down or stopping it in any ways doesn't make any sense. But unfortunately, that's how it is. That's how the, the rules are for, you know, immigration, which is, I, I really hope they are changed and, and it gets better because you want people to come in and you want them to go and do the most, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of, the things that people want to do, like if they want to start a company, they have an idea to do something, they should do it, right? So I was stuck into that. Like I didn't have a green card for quite some time. And as like, you know, it, take, it can take some time to do that. And I, I, the reason I moved to Silicon Valley and I wanted to come here was to, you know, work in startups and start my own startup. And I had multiple interesting ideas that, you know, I wanted to ideally start a company, but I just could not. And that was, you know, uh, and that was, that, was, that was bad. And I, I really hope, you know, it can get better. Uh, over time, but that's that's how it was. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, I like you, I'm an immigrant uh, coming from Africa and India, and, um, and, and I always find that there are incredible talent out there in the world, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. that want to come here to start up companies and bring their, uh, mm -hmm. com uh, their companies to life. Do, do you feel like some of these current challenges deter people or that you know, it, it prevents them really from doing it here and they'll do it somewhere else, especially in today's environment. Yeah, definitely. I think that's, if you, if you look at from a, from a US perspective, it's, it's very short-sighted to, to not encourage people to come in and start businesses in your country. 
right? You know, it's it's uh, but at the, at the same side, like for for India, it's great. Like you know, if people are not leaving and starting companies there, that, that is great. So I feel like it's a loss for uh, for the US to kind of create this uh, sort of a perception out there that you are not welcome. Like you know, US for a long time had the perception that like you know, it's a it's a land of opportunity. It's a land of immigrants. You know, if you come in here and you will be you will have all the opportunity. You know, opportunity as anyone who has been here before to start, you know, start a new life, start start businesses, start companies, and all of that, right? Once you start sending the perception out that that's not the case, that you're not really welcome. Good, talented people in the world have options, right? You know, it's like if you, so. If you look at like you know, when I graduated from IIT ninety nine, about you know the my class of computer science, like you know, who studied computer science was fifty five kids. Out of them, about eighty percent came to the US. now if i if you go to iit now the class that is graduating there only about 5% are coming to the us so in some ways it's a loss for the us but in a many ways it's really a big gain for for india so it's you know it's uh, uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's you know uh, where i would think the world should go is that we should remove all these boundaries like people should be allowed to go anywhere and start things and you know it's like it's the, the it's a, it's a glo- it should be this kind of a, if someone from us wants to go to india and start a business it should be very easy someone from india starts to wants to come from you know india to here and start a business or do something and you know it should be easy we we have to remove more and more boundaries you know i would say one thing you know this covid 19 is an unfortunate situation there is pandemic there is everything like you know the people are suffering everything but there is the, the one positive of that is actually it might break the the those barriers and boundaries much uh, much more because now it's it's much more possible of you know in this because we were like we we got this kind of jolt as a world to start learning how to operate in a distributed way operate in a in remotely now so it's much easier for someone to stay in india and build a global business same is like you know for someone to stay you know in, in any country like you know you can sit in a island and caribbean and build a silicon valley global business now because if you have to do everything remote and distributed right so that that is actually probably is a, is a great thing that you know it allows uh, it removes these boundaries of visas and immigrations and you know what you can do around it or not and it just creates a full creativity of people who want to you know whatever they want to do no thank you for that and i totally agree you know when you look at statistics and data entrepreneurship and startups are really the growth engines of any economy so mm-hmm. the more encouragement there is to be able to foster that the better for us so that's great thank you jyoti let me move on to your uh, journey at app dynamics and clearly a huge success and mm-hmm. i've heard you speak about having big goals big dreams big vision now with all of that behind you as you reflect back on that journey uh, what kind of advice or lessons learned or the things do you think about during that 8 9 10 years that that you were really driving that um mm-hmm. that i think there's a lot of questions people would love to uh, to uh, to ask you about that you know um my lessons learned and advice to to other entrepreneurs i do i, um, I give normally number one is i tell everyone is uh, don't jump into something if you're not really passionate about it you know if you're not passionate about solving a problem you know entrepreneurship is hard like you know it, it would never be smooth easy ride so you have to persevere through a lot of like you know good bad ugly kind of times right and if you're not passionate about the uh, solving some problem or some cause whatever you started your company with uh, you would not be able to go through that that those hard times right because that's what drives through that so that's my one advice to everyone i you know and second is like you how do you measure the that are you are you passionate about that problem and i ask people are you willing to spend 5 to 10 years of your life on something because that's what it takes like sometimes people think entrepreneurship is like it's a quick fix like you get like a quick success like you know i remember like you know and abdanomics became like a the first time we became like a billion dollar company as a in our valuation you know someone called me and said like how does it feel when you got the call that you're a billion dollar company so it is it's not like a won a lottery one day suddenly it's like there's 6 years of work behind it so it's not like you know so that's how pe- sometimes people think like you know you suddenly it's a, it's like you win a lottery and it's a, you know you, it is a lot of years and years of work that goes behind it right so that's what i tell entrepreneurs is like do keep that in mind if you start something that it's it will be years and years of work and you got to build on build on build something right then like once you do that how do you make a successful company like you know there's really no formula to it to be honest but um, my if i have to give a formula to someone and advice to someone i tell people just fo- make, make sure you focus on the basics 
don't forget the basics ever the basics of any business are really like and i learned it like you know with my dad small business back in rajasthan you know the the, the basics are same like you know that you have to uh, you have to sell a good product like that people care about you have to make sure your sales and marketing is like you know you have you do a really good job at it and you have to make sure you take care of your customers your customer service is quite good and then make sure you take care of your employees your employees are you know are are happy and you know they they want to work there so you can increase your business because you can't build a business just by yourself right so the basics of the business are not really that different and i tell and any entrepreneur like you know don't lose your focus on the the basics right you know it's and then most of the stuff will will happen from there um jyoti i've heard you speak about this concept of magic clay and and uh, i think you described that with with software and your mm-hmm. your your interest in engineering and so on but it's very clear the passion for a lot of this comes through when somebody listens to you so that's very clear where did that come from this magic clay kind of concept <laughs> uh I, i don't know i just made it up at one day but i <laughs> i i i i think like you know if you look at software you know it's it's if you look at like say 200 years ago there were only few people who would study math like you know people who had to do accounting or something would study math now it's like every kid studies math right when we grew up every kid has to study math like if you don't study math is like such a core part of your 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 life you have to study math software and computer science and programming is like that now like it's becoming like that like you know it's like you like the way it's like every had everyone had to study math not only people who needed math everyone had to study math programming is like that and i look at because pro, if you know programming and and software you can create things like you know mm-hmm. if you have to create like you're not happy about something like you know i'm not happy about how do i take taxis if you know programming you can build a new app to to simplify it probably right you know if you're not happy with like you know how banking is done and you want you know you, you, know, you can build something to you know to solve that problem and that's what i call it magic clay like software is like magic clay you can build whatever you want if you you know if you want to with that so it's uh, i do think like you know in the modern world programming and software and you know becomes this magic clay to solve problems that you would want to solve and you know uh, that's and everyone should uh, uh, should keep that in mind I think that's fantastic uh, advice Jyoti thank you for that um after app dynamics one might think it would be great for you to lie on a beach and have a tequila and relax after all that hard work but I know that you're not doing that you're very very busy so what keeps you busy these days and Ditti at the beginning mentioned big labs uh, harness traceable and usual ventures can you just share a little bit about w- what's motivating you today and and what are you doing Sure. So first of all, like you know, once uh, you know, Abdanovics was sold to Cisco, and um, I tried to retire. I thought, okay, that's about that's the right thing to do. Go on a beach and s- sip tequilas and don't do anything. That's the right thing to do. And I did try it, and I I was bored of it after six months. So uh, it's, so it's uh, it's not that I didn't try. The problem is like you know, it's just not full. It wasn't fulfilling enough for me, and and I gave it a lot of thought. Like, okay, what do I like to do, right? So and I realized like I like. you know sometimes you work for something you make enough money and then you retire and then you then you do things that you enjoy in my case i realized this is what i enjoy like doing running a business building a business innovation building products so this is my retirement really it's not like you know i'm working towards a retirement and then i'm going to enjoy something i do i enjoy this so i i would be doing this until i'm like uh, pretty old uh, so you know I, and i i gave it a lot of thought like what do i say if i you know uh, drill down into it what do i really really enjoy and i realize i i, I like three things i want to do one is i still want to continue building companies because i really enjoy that so i want to build and you know build good products and good companies and you know second is i want to help other entrepreneurs and other founders you know there is a there is a lot of learnings i can share i can help and mentor and coach and advise and all of that right the third thing is philanthropy especially actually when it comes to india like you know growing up in india you see all sort of like you know Uh, all sort of things uh, you know poverty to lack of education to lack of healthcare to all sort of things that i think as uh, as this kind of global indian community we can really help a lot so to me it's like you know all my analysis what a lot of thinking i was like, okay these are the three things i want to do so uh initially i thought maybe i can do and whenever i do something i want to do it right and do it like you know well not like a shallow job at it right uh, i did re- realize okay i can do the first two and maybe i should wait 10 years before i can put my time and energy for the last one so i'm not really doing 
a, you know, uh, you know, sort of a very deeply engaged philanthropy element uh, right now. But at some point, I would. Uh, but the first two, I realized, okay, you know, if I have to do first two right now, at least for the next ten years. What? So I, that's where I started my companies, my startup studio, where I can start building companies. And I have two companies now, Harness and Traceable, and I enjoy doing it. Both companies are doing really well. You know, we are. Um, you know, that's that's. Uh, that's you know exciting, and I'm passionate about it. And then I started the my venture firm, Unusual Ventures, uh, you know, with uh, uh, you know with, with, with my co-founder there, so that we can help other founders. Like it's a very different kind of venture firm. That's why we call it Unusual Ventures. You know, it's uh, where we uh, where we help really really help founders. And I the question we always ask is like you know when I started Abdanomics as an engineer turned first time founder, where I didn't really have much of the you know business experience, what help would I have needed? And so, can we provide that help to the founders that start things, and we so that we can give back and coach and mentor and advise there, right? So that's what we. So, in in if, you know, from my perspective, what I'm doing is what I'm passionate about, what I enjoy doing, which is right now I, out of the three things I I'm passionate about, I'm doing the first two. I don't have time for the third one yet, but that will, I'll do at some point as well. I think that your third uh, component there, you're probably already doing by helping all these startups who are actually helping communities and. And, and, and maybe Definitely. people don't know too much about big labs and unusual ventures because um, it, it's a wonderful idea of, of the studio, as you call it, with accelerators, incubators out there. But do, do you want to just share a couple of sentences on just what, what's unique about them and how you help startups? Because it, it is very impactful, especially with the startups you've already got harness and traceable. Sure. So, well, <laughs> big labs is unique in a different way that it's, it's big labs is all about, you know, for me, experimenting with problems I am passionate about. So if there's a small team. We 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 look at like you know what problems we are passionate about solving, and and the problems that we like some of the problems that we are solving might be too geeky or not interesting for someone else, right? Which is totally fine. Like you got to do what you are excited about, right? So you know, at big levels, we look at the problems that excites me. I want to solve, and a lot of them are to do with how do we accelerate software engineering, and how do we accelerate technology, and how do we make it even better and simpler for you have like 25 30 million software engineers in the world how do we make their 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 them more productive and uh, you know and better right so that's so those are the problems we are solving in big labs and very few like we have you know I've launched two companies out of big labs uh, there might be a third company there might never be a third company like you know we all only look at like companies that i feel very confident we can make a very significant multi billion dollar company so that's that's the goal at big labs uh, unusual ventures is different unusual ventures is is like you know i'm not doing the operating of the business it's more about really helping and mentoring and investing in other entrepreneurs, right? And we have a, you know, we we have a four hundred million dollar fund that we just uh, you know launched last year. You know, it's uh, it's it's one of the the biggest seed funds in Silicon Valley right now, uh, and we have a very unique model about you know becoming really sort of an extended part of the companies we invest in and 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 teach them and make them successful in the in the very early stages. What our uh, philosophy at at Unusual Ventures is that the, the most founders need most help. From that idea stage to the first million dollars of revenue, after that things start to get a bit easier. That's like the really, really, really hard part. And so we we have designed unusual ventures in with focus on that. Like, how do we help founders go from that idea to the first million dollars of revenue? So. I think that's fantastic, Jyoti. And as I said, I've read a lot of wonderful things about what you're doing, and especially with the two startups you've got, uh, Traceable and uh, Harness. So wonderful! Congratulations on that. Let me move away into our kind of last segment here um, of just the current affairs and what's going on in the world. And, and, and the, without making it too personal, I thought given the events in the world going on today, I can't help but ask about your perspectives on the elections and the US and just how does one make sense of what's going on in the world? Maybe it's just 2020, an odd year, but do you have a, do you have a, a big picture view of, of of life today? Sure. Um, let's say, you know, there is the, if you look at like right now where we sit here in the San Francisco Bay Area, the two, or in the US, the two, the top two things, you have the pandemic first and then there's elections and uh, that that is going on, right? So pandemic is once, it's, it's, it is once in 50 years, once in 100 years kind of thing, right? So it's, it's uh, it has, uh, you know, can, you know, can, would the world deal with something like this better next time? I'm pretty sure you know people will learn from it and do better. Could the world have dealt better with it this time? It could have, and like you know, but some countries did quite well. And I, actually, I, I, you know, 
I know in, in, in India, things are, are not perfect around COVID. Things have gotten bad, but I, I think India has done a great job with the, the, the population we have and like, you know, how well it was kind of managed through such a massive population, uh, you know, that we have. Some countries who have not done a good job, I think as, as uh, like the most developed country in the world, US, we could have done better. Uh, so, you know, when uh, I think we, uh, there are definitely things to learn from there, but from pandemic, you know, it, it has also changed things in how we'll operate going forward, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now you have the, you know, the second big topic happening, the election. I know a lot of us glued to, uh, you know, CNN and following what's happening. And I really hope in the, it's resolved in the next day or two, but it's, uh, you know, it's the, I think the, the sad part about this election and like even the last four or five years is there is, there is a big you know, the, this, the U.S. as a country is quite divided right now. You have like, you know, you have a big divide of like, you know, half the country thinks other half is, doesn't understand them and the other half is, you know, is, is doesn't make any sense. And that's a strong divide. Like, you know, it's a really strong disconnect and divide right now. And we see some of that, like why this election is so contentious and, you know, why we, uh, you know, into into this. Uh, and uh, And I hope that divide comes down over time. But, and we, as a society, you know, we have to kind of uh, look at, you know, and you can think of it, that's divide is not just in the US, by the way, I think it's starting to happen in other places. We have the, the one downside of technology and software and this, like it changes so many things so fast and the societies are not being able to adapt to it fast enough. If you look at it in the US, you know, we have like, you know, soft, like the people who are in the kind of this white collar information economy, you know, they're, they're mostly doing well. Like, you know, it's not like, you know, that's the, but if you have in the sort of the blue collar industrial economy, you know, it's, it's been a struggle and like, you know, the more and more software and automation that comes in, it will become even harder. Right. So that's, that's the divide and disconnect that is manifesting in a lot of this, uh, why the country is so divided and you, you can fast, fast forward that. And that will happen in other countries as well. Like it's not just the U S you will see that in Europe, you will see that in, you know, in, uh, in Asia, you'll see that in India as, as well at some point where like, you know, people who are in the tech, uh, uh, you know, and the information economy, they are doing quite well. And the people, you know, and, and people in, who are not in that are maybe struggling with the jobs and because a lot and lot of the jobs and work could be automated with technology, right? So, so we really as a society have to think of, you know, technology by itself, you know, is doing a lot of in terms of innovation and progress, but the, the downside of it, we have to manage by investing in education, by investing in like retraining, by investing in like, you know, Maybe even things like universal income, you know, uh, to 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 help the, you know, help balance the society. Yeah, thank you, Jyoti, for those perspectives. And you know, with all the chaos going on, let me maybe ask you a question, forward-looking, on a positive note. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. with the as you reflect on the promise of technology disruption, right, with mm -hmm. everything out there, such as AI and blockchain and five G and quantum computing. As you as you, given you love innovation, as you look at the next five years, maybe. Um, but what do you what do you see? What excites you? What do you think we should all be looking forward to? <laughs> well, technology is is uh, is changing fast, very quickly everywhere. I think you know we we are still very very early on the promise of AI automation, robotics, uh, and I do think that going to be such a differentiating, game changing thing over the next five ten years. That you know more and more things that we that we didn't think was possible to automate, uh, you know, through some kind of uh, intelligent system would be automated. Uh, and so that's definitely going to going to happen, you know, the con connectivity of the world, you know, everyone connected is already has happened in the last five, 10 years, it will continue to 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 increase like, you know, it's, uh, you know, as I said, like the one positive part of COVID is like, it just forced the level of connectivity that you know, in just in six months that, you know, it, it would have taken another six years really, right? So that's like the, the you know, so many things being disrupted by just such this hyper connectivity, uh, video everywhere, you know, uh, uh, high bandwidth everywhere that will continue to, to change. I do think there is a, another part of technology, like, you know, uh, tech converging with, with biology, you know, and medicine. And, you know, that's a interesting, uh, exciting area of innovation we'll see you know, kind of some groundbreaking things that may happen in the next, you know, five years or so. 
Um, Jyoti, you're intimately familiar with Silicon Valley, clearly, but I do understand you've traveled quite a bit to India as well, and you've looked at the startup ecosystem there. I have a question mm -hmm. that's come in from the audience, but before I maybe ask that, just sure. what, what are your views on on just the Indian startup um, um, kind of ecosystem? And, and mm -hmm. I'm very excited. I, too, have traveled over there, and I, I deal with a number of startup companies, but mm -hmm. I would I think the audience would love to hear your sure. views. I, I would say I'm extremely, extremely bullish on the Indian startup ecosystem. I think we'll, we'll see like, you know, lots of international, uh, multinational, let's say, startups coming out of India. You, look, uh, you know, you already have, you have what, what like uh, 10 or 15 unicorn kind of companies that have uh, uh, formed in India. If you look at the the sort of the, the waves of startup activity in India, right? So in the, in the, in the, the first wave was really the 90s with the companies like, you know, Arvin uh, starting in 80s, uh, the Infosys and Wipro and, T and TCS, they were startups at that time, right? You know, now we think of them as big, large companies, but they were startups and they were innovative in their ways and they sold to the global markets and they sold in US and Europe and they did quite well and they became these massive businesses doing those, right? The second wave of startups in India after that was the like, you know, startups selling to the Indian consumers, like, you know, your flip cards and all of that, right? And they were, you know, uh, bringing technology to, to, uh, to, to solve a lot of things for them, which is, and India has a massive consumer uh, base. So it's, you know, you can build very successful companies doing it. I do think there's a third wave that's, that's happening now in the last three, five years is like, you know, building product kind of startups from India that can sell to worldwide markets. Right. So, and, you know, a lot of these are these B2B SaaS kind of products that you could sell. India, we have a unique advantage of the talent, right? You know, there is so many smart engineers in India. And now, as I said, like, you know, like in, in, in back in 99, when I graduated from IIT, 80% of the class came here to the US. Now it's only 5% of the class is coming there. So you have 95% of the, those engineers are, are, you know, back there. So there's a lot of good talent. So there's a huge advantage of talent and engineering of like, you know, smart people. Uh, so it's a matter of time, like, you know, more and more interesting products will come out of there. And like, you know, uh, so I'm, I'm really, really bullish on Indian startup ecosystem. You know, sometimes people are like, you know, Indian startup ecosystem hasn't seen too many successes. And I tell them it's a matter of time. Like, you know, we have enough coming up now. And like, you know, some of these will start becoming role models for other startups and other companies will leave things and start, start companies. The venture capital ecosystem in India is pretty thriving as well. I do think like, you know, the world becoming more distributed and people, the distributed remote nature of work will make it even easier. So if I had to bet on Indian startup uh, startups and startup ecosystem in general, I would, I would bet big. Yeah. And, and access to capital is a lot more easier mm -hmm. and, and, and affordable in places that before it wasn't, you had to be in Silicon Valley. Thank you, Jyoti. So the question that was being asked, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, sure. but if you were uh, to start a company uh, in today and you were graduating in 2020, would you yeah. do it in the US or, or in the Indian uh, thriving ecosystem there? Any, any particular views? Uh, well, if, I'm, if I was graduating from school today in 2020, I would just stay in India and do it there because there is all the the ecosystem is quite thriving and quite rich, right? You know, it's like there is venture capital, there is access to capital, there are enough, you know, people, engineers who want to work in product startups. Uh, but I do also think that it's becoming much more global now. Like, you know, you don't have to pick that it's an Indian startup or it's an American startup or it's a British startup. You could be like a global startup. And that, I do think five years from now, that's what we'll see most companies. That like, you know, and it's starting, it's like happening very quickly. Like if you look at like most companies in Silicon Valley, they are declaring that once COVID is over next year and all employees can work from anywhere. So there is, what is the definition of Silicon Valley at that time, right? Or like people working from here, we'll still have the, 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 the Silicon Valley as a, you know, as sort of this kind of the, the cultural, uh, the innovation, cultural, you know, mindset, that concept will there, we'll still have a lot of ecosystem here. At, but in terms of like, you know, what does it mean to be physically present is going to change so quickly, right? So. I think right now it's, you don't need to, like in 99, you know, if I had to really start companies and be like, you know, create like a, you know, billion dollar company and be successful with it and all, I had to move to Silicon Valley. That's not the case anymore. So it's now it's a choice of like, you know, you want to or not, right? You know, and, and India is great right now. You know, I've, I see like friends and I see like other, other you know, uh, students coming out of schools and starting really exciting companies and doing a lot of exciting innovation and and they're also nailing how to be global companies over time right so that's that's all all great i think you know that's what i would do as well 
And, and Jyoti, I've got a question here, and I'm assuming it's from a young person who's saying, um, if I really do have ambition to create my own startup and I'm graduating this year, should I first working for a startup company or should I go to some of the larger big tech companies to learn? Uh, and you've done this through the, mm. uh, in your early days, right? Having worked at several companies before App Dynamics. Mm. Any perspective there? Sure. Well, if you want to start your startup or learn about startups, work in a startup. Working in a large company, you're not going to really learn as much about it. And, you know, also I would tell you, like, you know, working in a large company, what you learn in five years, you will normally learn that in a one year in a high growth startup. Because things are changing so fast, you have to adapt, you have to learn, you have to learn, you have to learn, and there's no one to teach you. Because in a, in a large company, you will have like training departments and education departments and, you know, employee development departments and all of those. And in a startup, you're like, you're really thrown in the, like, you know, it's like you're thrown in the swimming pool, you have to learn how to swim yourself fast, right? It's, it's a... It's fast learning. So if you do want to start companies and start up like this, the, you know, the person who asked this question, I would say go and work in startups. You're going to learn a lot and learn pretty fast. And, you know, many times people think that they're only going to learn in a successful startup. You learn a lot in a failed startup. And there is really no stigma in working in a failed startup. You will actually probably learn much more in a failed startup on what not to do and, you know, what things could cause failures. So that's not also also, also like, you know, key part of learning about startups. Wonderful. I, I've got a couple more questions, Jyoti, if you're okay me asking these. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I think people are just curious to learn about your experiences. The first one, mm -hmm. um, in terms of funding today, mm -hmm. given big labs and unusual ventures, with the pandemic um, and fundraising for startups, uh, is it easier to be able to get access to capital? Are people still fundraising, creating funds or have people pivoted and really just in protection mode? What, what are your thoughts just around that whole funding aspect? Uh, you know, no one knew what to do in the pandemic, right? So when the, this started, people were, okay, the, what will happen to venture capital and can investors really invest without meeting people uh, in person, et cetera. But you know, the, the, the main thing is people learn, people adapt. You know, that's what we do as humans, right? So the, the, the venture capital, uh, world has adapted very quickly as well. So there, there was a slowdown for maybe a month or two back in like March, April, around then. There is really no slowdown. Like, you know, so the venture capital firms are raising new new funds, uh, you know, as much as they were doing before this, you know, the, the they're investing as much as they were doing before it. And all, you know, it's people, the, the, the VC firms have adop, adapted to it. So if you are an entrepreneur, um, you there is really not much difference. The only difference is like in a lot of times investors, as the when you invest in a company it's like a you know it's a long relationship you are getting into like you know five years ten years you will be working with someone right so there is some discomfort still that happens that you haven't met someone in person so i think as you know so both the investor side and the entrepreneur side have to make that effort in kind of getting to know each other so there is a comfort on in making that investment so a lot of times you will see like you know investors making investments fast with like entrepreneurs they have probably known from before or like you know people they have known from before you know instead of creating this you know it's it, in in the, in the world of video and pandemic it's uh, it's it's easy to continue an existing relationship it's a little bit harder to create a new relationship right so there has th that part has to be addressed with a little bit more effort and you know i see like especially in, in in silicon valley now like you know many vcs and investors are meeting people in like this kind of a socially distanced you meet outside, you go for a walk and talk and, you know, get, you know, get to know each other. So people are figuring out ways of how to, how to, to do this. Um, but I don't see much of a slowdown at all. Wonderful. Thank you, Jyoti. And I have one more question. So I'll give the audience uh, a chance to ask any more questions here before we wrap up, if there are any. But, um, and I think this is really going towards uh, your, your app dynamics uh, days. Uh, mm -hmm. Jyoti, but it, uh, give, uh, would you share some thoughts about what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur and CEO, actually mm -hmm. growing and, and running the, the business? And uh, do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I wish there was one simple formula <laughs> that anyone could use. Uh, you know, I think the number one thing uh, to be a successful entrepreneur and CEO in my mind is you just have to persevere through things. Things are never easy. Like, you know, it's uh, people are looking for easy paths on things. Entrepreneurship is hard. So you just have to take like, you know, that failure is not an option. 
and now you find a way you persevere through it right and that is the you know that's what it takes normally like you know and i, I look at like you do that and then many times you you want to have like a big goal like where you want to get to but you have to be able to break it into smaller chunks that you so that you focus you focus on like you know otherwise you can be lost like you know i normally don't like to give too much startup advice because i feel there is so much advice out there that people it confuses entrepreneurs that it's you know when i was an entrepreneur like there were like thousands of pieces of advice out there how to be a successful business person and how to be a successful entrepreneur and at some point i was like i'm i'm lost with all this advice like you know i just not need to set like small goals and like you know just find a way to re- meet like you know it's almost like you know you just find how do you go from the first milestone to second second to third and you find your way you don't give up you just find your way to get there and you find your way to get to the next one and you find your way to get to the next one and you will eventually get to the you know to some kind of outcome so I, most my biggest advice remain focused on basics you know find a way to succeed in each of the different things and don't give up and that's that's all it takes that's just fantastic uh, jyoti i have one more question that just came in i don't know if you feel comfortable uh, just a sentence or two on sure. this but around data privacy you know mm-hmm. when you think about technology and as you said it's pervasive and connecting all of us um mm-hmm. any any particular thoughts on what's going on in the world of 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 privacy as you look around the world especially with EU and the new California privacy uh-huh. laws that have come out I think data privacy laws are great i i you know I, i'm in the camp of like you know the technology companies it's their moral responsibility uh to not use consumers and users data in in bad ways you know i, I do think the you know personally i don't even like the this kind of advertising based model where you're using showing like the facebook model it's to me it's just a bad model for our society like you know to me it's like you know if you look at apple apple is building great products and they're charging money for it and the consumers are fine paying money for it if you look at zoom like you know zoom is a great product and they are charging for it and consumers are fine paying for it same thing with facebook it's a, it's a, it's a good service good product if they charged consumers slight money like the way zoom does it and there is a free model they probably will still be very very successful still be like you know uh, a massive company worldwide so this whole concept of like you know we have to monetize using consumers private data i just don't buy it i think that's just bad for society and eventually the societies the, the governments have to regulate it and so now governments are regulating it they are behind on regulating it so you know eu has done a good job california is starting to get there in the in the us uh you know i know you know the indian government has taken measures toward it uh, you know in, in in some ways but there more measures need to be taken towards it uh i it's it's uh, you know as consumers we have to make sure our our private data is you know people are just that we own our 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 data our, our information like you know and it's it, the, there's no excuse for technology companies to to misuse your data or monetize your data in ways that you don't even understand as a consumer Thank you Jyoti and you know in, in speaking with you has reminded me of the best food I've ever tasted in all my travels in India which was at a dhaba about a roadside just outside of Jaipur in Rajasthan so this has been truly a, a great honor for me um and time has flown by with our conversation mm-hmm. here and we really want to thank you Jyoti for allowing us to spend a few minutes in your shoes and learning from your experiences you're an inspiring role model for so many and we wish you blessings and positive wishes for your continued success um for the audience here we invite you to please continue this conversation at india story hashtag india story uh stay safe and well everybody and now we'll bring it back to dipti thank you kalish and thank you jyoti for sharing your india story with the us it's so inspiring thank you to the honorable consul general and his team to dia tv and our team here at usispf for making this possible so please please stay tuned for the next india story this was the inaugural one and send us your tweets comments and suggestions like kalish mentioned using hashtag india story thank you all for joining us thank you everyone and and i want to make a special mention that jyoti uh, jyoti mentioned that you'll be uh, staying back because we have 10 startup ceos